This is Boomer Life on CIL 650. You raise me This is Boomer Life on CL 650. I'm Joanne Sutton in studio today with Maria Howard. Maria is the CEO of the Alzheimer's Society of British Columbia. And I loved, Maria, when we were just speaking earlier, how you mentioned uh, about your vision with the society before a cure, there's care. It's a reminder to all of us that if you've received a diagnosis, you're not alone in this journey, that there actually is help out there. It's really important for people to know when they've received a diagnosis that there is somewhere to turn to start asking questions, to um, start to be able to weave through the information. And and it's a lot. And sometimes people can't sort of process all at once. Um, But it's better to begin to know that there is somebody there who's willing to help and and guide you through that than to be... um, you know, frightened and 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 not tell anybody. It, it's it's tough to be alone in anything, um, but certainly with dementia and Alzheimer's, it's it's even harder. So our next guest on Boomer Life is Lynn Jackson. Lynn is a former nurse who has lived in both Mexico and Puerto Rico prior to receiving her diagnosis of frontotemporal dementia, and that was back in 1999. Lynn has long found inspiration in dementia advocacy. Just wait till you hear what this woman has accomplished. Currently, Lynn is a member of the Alzheimer's Society of BC's Dementia Friendly Communities Leadership Group of People with Dementia. So Lynn, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming in. So with BC's election just around the corner, I think today is a great opportunity to talk about the importance of people advocating for dementia-related issues to help shape policy. And I know you have a history in this. So maybe to start off, could you talk a little bit about your personal experience of this dementia journey? I could take a long time talking to you about (laughs) that. But anyway, um, a few examples. I... When I was working in uh, Mexico City, I started to um, become uh, using foul language, which I which was very unusual for me. I uh, started dumping coffee grounds into my cereal, orange juice into my coffee. Uh, like I said, angry outbursts with coworkers, which really wasn't my style. I'd I'd been an emergency room nurse for many years, and I, you know, cool, calm, collected, and so there were big changes in big your changes. behavior. Yeah, I'd go to a hospital to v- visit clients, and I'd be at the elevator, and I, I didn't know really what I was there for. It, it, it was, it was really unnerving for me, and and I just break into tears and go home. I, I, when I moved to Puerto Rico, I couldn't remember my new address. I'd be dialing clients um, and to be talking to them. And then when they answered, I didn't know who, who I was talking to and what I wanted to talk to them about. It was, it was really uh, lots of things. And um, so what really, did you actually think at the time was happening to you? Well, I didn't really know, um, but what got me to a neurologist was that uh, the bottom of my right foot, I, this is in Puerto Rico, was going numb, and I, I was seeing a chiropractor about it, and after the third time, he said to me, I really can't help you, I think you need to see a neurologist. So I got referred to a neurologist, and uh, who actually happened to be a psychiatrist, cause I'm, and I'm thinking, boy, if one can't help me, you know, the other side <laughs> the other. of them can, and... Um, he examined me physically, mentally, and, uh, ordered an MRI and in the States you can have one within three days. And we had one and, um, I picked up the results and, uh, I looked at the results and I couldn't, I read them. I couldn't figure out if I had too much or too little brain. And here me, a nurse that had worked in Emerge for many years, read a lot of MRI results. This was, um... Very puzzling for me. I could I, I couldn't figure it out. Uh, then what happened was um, one of my coworkers. Uh, we went to uh, she, she went with me to a, one of her clients who was a neurologist. He looked at these scans and said, "You have the brain of a very old person." And I was only forty three at the time, oh, so um, we knew that uh, I needed more investigation than just what I could get in Puerto Rico. And But to this doctor's credit, he did put me on the Alzheimer drug um, right away. It was uh, available at that time, a year before the, it was available in Canada. And um, th- then what happened was that the company I worked for made arrangements for me to 
be investigated in Boston at a huge multi t- uh, teaching hospital. So um, I was there on and off. I went back and forth. And over the next year and a half, it was determined that I had frontal temporal dementia. Oh, my gosh. So yeah. um, so what does that mean? What is frontal temporal well, dementia? Um, d- it is one of the types of dementia. There are Alzheimer's as a type, frontal temporal, Lewy body, Parkinson's dementia, vascular dementia. It's all under the umbrella term dementia. Uh, so with my dementia, it is affects the frontal part of my brain and the sides, which uh, is um, executive functioning, planning, and um can start to develop speech. But everybody's different, though. It depends what part of the brain is being affected at what time. And everybody's different as, as to how it affects them. So obviously this changed your life completely. Yeah, I had to move back to Vancouver and move in with my parents again, which uh, they had to look after me. Um, luckily, what happened was um, I, and I got referred to UBC, they investigated me there, and um, I, I w- it was determined that I these anger outbursts were still an issue, but also I had apathy. I just didn't couldn't do anything. Um, and didn't care. Didn't care, yeah. And um, so I was sent to a um, geriatric psychiatrist here in Vancouver who also has a degree in pharmacology. Um, he's one of the smartest people I know, and um, he put me on a combination of medications that got me back into the land of living again and uh, I started my journey living with this because before I just didn't care which um, was wasn't like me and I didn't like that I don't think well, what, yeah. what what I've learned about you in a very very short time is that you're you seem very, extremely independent. That you're a go getter. That uh, you'll fight for a cause, uh, which will bring us to the topic of today of raising your voices for advocacy for dementia. And tell tell me a little bit about how you got involved with that and why you felt that you had to be a, a voice. Well, what happened was when I moved back to Vancouver, there wasn't a support group for people with dementia here, and. Um, it, it, this was in 1999, so and the med, Alzheimer medications were just new then, and so to everyone's credit, they didn't really know how long we would last, right? So uh, the Alzheimer Society, I went to an event, and they said, I said, um, do you have a, a support group in Vancouver? And they said, no, come back in the spring. So I came back in the spring. Oh, no, we'll come back in six months, and finally, I. I found a group on the internet called Coping with Personal Memory Loss, a Yahoo group, and it was a a lot of people with memory problems, but there were nine of us that were diagnosed with Alzheimer's, frontal temporal, vascular dementia, whatever, and we decided we would form our own group, and this was called, we called it Dementia Advocacy and Support Network International, DASNI for short, and um, this was in 2001. Um, and that year, 13 of us um, were able to, and the people f- from Australia, from the States, and me from Canada, we met in Montana at somebody's farm that uh, accommodated us there. And we had a, what we call the Montana, our Montana Summit. And we wrote a proposal to Alzheimer's Disease International, which is the big the top of uh, of the umbrella of the umbrella for all the <laughs> Alzheimer's societies around the world. We didn't know how long we would last. We had to, and we weren't getting anywhere in our countries. We decided to go to the top, and it just happened that one of the women that was writing this proposal was on her way to London, England, and and uh, gave this proposal to Alzheimer's Disease International. They listened to us. And that year, in 2001, they invited us to come to their annual general meeting, which was in Christchurch, New Zealand. Oh, my. And uh, it was um, a, a great experience in that they, um, one, one of us was able to give a plenary speech, and the others, we gave workshops. We had a booth there that we'd made, and we were the hit of the conference, I tell you, because uh, people couldn't believe that there were people with dementia there walking and talking, let alone giving speeches and having a booth that they made themselves. So it it was quite exciting times. Um, But every year since then, 
MERS Disease International has had somebody with dementia give a, in their plenary sessions and also included them in other sessions. And even, uh, for example, the time in Canada that it was, I believe, in 2010, uh, they had a full stream just for people with dementia, and that's continued over the years now. Well, who would have ever thought? I think you've already broken uh, a, a, a <laughs> dozens of myths and stigmas that we all might own uh, towards our opinion of, of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. Uh, oh, my gosh. Can you tell me about some of the work you might have done locally with the Alzheimer's <laughs> Society of BC, making contact with them and, and, and what you do for us here in BC? Well, um, in 2001, we did start a support group for people with dementia in Vancouver. There had been other ones in West New Westminster and um, North Van, but there had there wasn't any in Vancouver proper. And um, so we started that. There was only five of us to begin, and since then it's grown. There's two groups now, and probably room for others. Um, I, I, I was asked uh, to give top in BC, around the world, and, and across Canada. I was part of, um, in 2004, MARAP, which is the Murray Alzheimer um, Education Research Program out of the University of Waterloo. They approached DASNY and um, wanted to know if we wanted to have a, a, a symposium just for people with dementia. So we worked. I worked on that, planning that. That happened in 2006 and has happened subsequently most years after that. Um, what else? Let's see. Um, well, I, I'm just sitting here with my jaw on oh. the floor because you you described to us earlier in this interview how frontotemporal dementia affects your planning and programming process. Well, but I've had help from uh, the, the Alzheimer's Society. Uh, Those early days, I, could, I was not able to give... Uh, I, was not, I wasn't a writer to write presentations or whatever. And um, at that time, there was only one person in the advocacy department at, at um, the Alzheimer's Society of BC, Barbara Lindsay. She helped me a lot with presentations. And then there was a volunteer who was a retired radio TV reporter, and he helped me immensely to put together nice uh, PowerPoint presentations. And uh, it, if it wasn't for their help, I, I wouldn't have been able to really get the word out. So they have helped me so much. What would you say are some of the highlights along the way that's um, most meaningful to you? Well, I think knowing that I was part of a grassroots organization f of people with dementia that helped get the ball rolling to get support around the world, that's been really meaningful for me. Uh, the next is um, this our DASNY group. We had a, um, a chat room, and ev in 2003, this woman named Lisa Genova would come to um, the chat room. And she was a neurobiologist from Harvard. And uh, long story short, Lisa Genova uh, was there just to learn about people with dementia, what it felt like. She wrote the book Still Alice, which became the movie, which then Juliet Moore won Best Actress in 2016. And um, so... Being part of that, uh, knowing that I've helped... Um, you were part of her research. Research, and, and knowing when I go into a bookstore that my name is in that book, still Alice there. <laughs> that, that's quite exciting. But the most important is my early stage support group um, that I, I go to. We ha we'd go to, we have it twice a month, and it, most every time when we're finished, someone will say, boy, that really helped me. I feel so good. You know, I'm so glad you guys feel the same as me. And you, you gave me some good ideas. It's that, that's really been invaluable for me. You yeah. get a lot out of that. So yeah. what encouragement would you give to someone else who has uh, received a diagnosis similar to yours? It could be any form of dementia or Alzheimer's disease. Uh, what would you say to them? Well, I, I would say that you're not alone, um, that you need... You, if you, you know, it, it really helps you if you are with other people that have the same problem. You 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 will start to feel better. Um, uh, it's hard to for some people to come out and uh, even acknowledge that they have a diagnosis, come out of the closet, so to speak. But um, once once you do, I think it's uh, really quite helpful. 
And if somebody wanted to meet you or join one of your advocacy groups or your support groups, what would be the best way? Would they just call the Alzheimer's Society, Maria, or? Absolutely. I mean, Lynn is such a great uh, supporter and volunteer and helper and um, in many ways. And so, um, you know, if someone wanted to connect with with Lynn or, or however that would, Lynn would be comfortable with that, they could certainly call our office or the Dementia Helpline. Um, the one eight hundred nine three six six zero three three, and uh, we could we could see how that could become together. And and I want I want to say too that um, you know not to be afraid to advocate for others. It's not for everybody, but um, you f- I find that um, you know you you do. It's such a good feeling to help knowing that you are helping other people, they feel good, but because you're helping them, you feel good too. So it's a win-win situation. Lynn Jackson, thank you so much for sharing your story today. I think just by being here, you've helped us feel better by having this conversation. Thank you. This is Boomer Life on CL 650. I'm Joanne Sutton, along with Maria Howard, CEO of the Alzheimer's Society of BC. And you've just heard from our guest, Lynn Jackson, who's speaking about her life and her advocacy work, even after a diagnosis of frontotemporal dementia. You can always get more information online at alzheimerbc.org. Rebecca Morris is the manager of the Advocacy and Education Department of the Alzheimer's Society of BC. And we're going to meet her next on Boomer Life on CL 650. Celebrate. The Baby Boomer Lifestyle. This is Boomer Life on CL 650.